This is Tracy here for another edition of A View from Tracy's Point, and we are here to recap Shots Fired Season 1, Episode 8, which was titled Rock Bottom. And guys, there's only two episodes left to this great, great show. So let's go ahead and get started. So when the show opens up, there's a scene with Ash, and looks like she may be contemplating suicide. I'm not sure what was going on in that scene, but she's sitting there in the dark, and she has a gun in her hand, and it's like she's just really thinking and reflecting over her life, and I'm sure, you know, it has a lot to do with Kai and the possibility of losing custody and not being able to see her, and thinking about, you know, her little scheme with Javier that didn't work out. And then the whole thing where she was stopped by um, Lieutenant Breland on the side of the road that night and his threat of filing the police report, you know, that she was drunk and fought him and all this different stuff. So not sure what was going on, but it did look like she was thinking about committing suicide. So then she gets up and she goes to the, I call it the storyboard room, but she goes into that other um, hotel room where they have, you know, all their investigation stuff and the storyboards and all that they're working on. So when she goes in there, she takes the gun that she had and she's putting it into a drawer. And then all of a sudden she realizes that there's somebody in the room with her. And so the person um, hits her in the face and knocks her out and then run out of the room. So they're thinking that the whoever it was in the room was trying to find that phone because remember they had showed the video to, um, to Cheryl Platt in the last episode. So that was an interesting <laughs> twist. So then we have uh, President Ash and they go to see Pastor Janae in jail because y'all know they done locked Pastor Janae up and you know, for the murder of Joey Campbell. And so they, you know, are asking her, you know, did she kill Joey Campbell? And so she's basically telling them that it wasn't her, that she's being set up. And then Ash is asking her, well, why would anybody set you up? What would be their reasoning? And so Pastor Janae has to give her a history lesson on uh, racism in the South and how they don't really need a reason. Just the fact that you're black and you're standing in their way is reason enough for them to go after you and that it's so easy to set um, black people up in poor rural communities. So it's nothing new, you know, what she's experiencing. And so we find out that the gun um, that was used in Joy Campbell's murder was found in Pastor Janae's office, but they can't identify the serial numbers because it's been like soldered off or they tried to scrape it off or something. So Ash and Preston get a subpoena from the Department of Justice to take custody of the gun. And so Ash says that, um, so the reason they wanted the gun was because Ash said that there's a way that you can still get to the serial number even if they've tried to shave it off and that she knows someone who can, you know, get that information who specializes in that. So the impression is like, well, who is it? And she's like, well, don't worry about it. So then Ash goes back to her room and she Skypes into Javier. So Javier is the person <laughs> that she knows that can get the information, but he's telling her that there's other people that can help her with this information, but she says he's the best and he's the only one that she trusts. But before she got to the part about the gun, she did apologize for, you know, trying to set him up and the way she acted and everything. And so Javier, I think he really does love Ash because he did break down and tell her that he would help her this one time. So it turns out that Javier was able to get the serial number off the gun and it is registered to Arlen Cox. So I'm like, okay. So then um, Ash has him on speakerphone and she's in the room with Preston when he calls, you know, with the information and lets her know that he's faxing over, you know, the um, registration to the gun and everything. And so Javier lets her know that they're not partners, they're not lovers, they're not together anymore, and that she's not to call his phone again unless it is about Kai. And other than that, he don't want to hear from her. So it was like a really embarrassing moment for her because Preston heard the conversation, but they did get the information that they were looking for. 
So they go and they call in um, Arlen Cox to talk to him about the gun. And he already has a story trumped up where he says that the gun was reported, that the gun was stolen like two months ago and that he did file a police report. So then Ash leaves the room to go out um, and talk to one of the deputies about the police report and the guy prints it off. So there was a police report saying that the gun was stolen. And I'm just like, these people are too slick. And you know, my daddy, God bless his soul. <laughs> he's always say, while we sleeping, the white folks be up plotting. And this is a perfect example because they have like covered all their bases, you know, with this whole setup because they know that Arlen Cox shot and killed that boy. And it reminds me of that case. Was it in, um, was it South Carolina or North Carolina where the guy was like the retiree and he was on the, you know, the volunteer police force and he accidentally, well, he said he was going for a taser, but he shot the black guy. And I can't remember what the guy's name is, but I'm telling you, this series is just coming from all the angles of all the foolishness that has taken place in the news with police brutality. So next we have a scene where Ash and Preston, they go to see um, Sherlane in the hospital. And remember, she was the reporter that was in the car accident after interviewing Kiana. And so she tells them that um, Kiana did open up to her and told her that she heard two gunshots and she, you know, went to see what was going on. And when she turned the corner of the building, she saw Arlen Cox standing over Joey Campbell's body. And she said that there was also two other deputies there. And she knew who one of the deputies was, but she didn't know who the other deputy was. And so she's told them that, you know, they need to find Kiana, but she doesn't know how, you know, whether the people are going to believe her or not. But then they let her know that uh, Kiana then ran out on them and they don't know where she's at. So they're pretty much stuck, you know, because Ash pointed out that, you know, Kiana is a black woman, you know, with a sketchy past. And then you got Corey, who's black, that is really not going to make a difference because they'll end up with an all-white jury who's going to try, you know, who's going to say that they're not credible witnesses. So then we move over to Shamika Campbell. And, of course, she's out looking for Sean, who called himself running away in the last episode. And so she finds out that um, Pastor Janae has been arrested that, you know, in charge with Joey's murder, you know, so she's looking like, are you serious? Then we have a scene where Alicia Carr goes to see Shamika and the two share, you know, a common bond because it's approaching Mother's Day and this is going to be the first Mother's Day without, you know, their sons and at least Shamika still has Sean, but I think that Jesse was the only child because I don't remember any other children being featured in this show. And so I'm thinking it's going to be doubly hard for her, but Alicia assures Shamika that Sean will come back and that everything is going to be okay. So then uh, we go to Lieutenant Breland and they're in the, um, what do they call it, where all the police officers gather in the morning for their, for their, um, so like a pep talk and instructions for the day. So anyway, uh, Lieutenant Breland lets them know that they got to get their numbers up. They got to raise some money to cover the riot, you know, and all the overtime that they had to put in and pay out to the deputies because of the riot. So now they need to go out there and just trump up charges against people, you know, to get like ticket money and all this stuff to recoup the money that the county is going to lose because of the riots. Then we have Deputy Brooks who goes out and he stops this black guy. And so he tells the guy that he failed to turn on his turn signal 100 feet from the stop. It's just like some, I'm sure it's on the books, but it's probably some law that is never, ever, ever adhered to. And so it was a $150 ticket. And then the guy's like, okay, I already owe a bunch of money for another ticket that you guys gave me. Can you cut me a break? And you can tell that uh, Deputy Brooks, he wants to help the guy out, but he knows that he's got to write this ticket. And so he tells the guy he's sorry, you know, but he can't do it. And so while um, Deputy Brooks, you know, he's out on the beat and he's riding around and he comes 
upon this crack house and I don't know what possessed him to stop and go in but he gets out of his car and then he walks up to the house and of course people start to disperse and then he goes inside and there is a guy in there that's trying to rob this boy and he realizes that it's Sean that the guy is trying to rob so he breaks it up and gets Sean out of the house and so then the two of them start having a conversation as they're in the car you know about racism and police brutality and just how you know um, the police officers treat the black people in that town and then Brooks shares with him you know about having to write the ticket to the guy earlier and how he wanted to give the guy a pass and not you know do the ticket but he's going to use you know taking Sean back to his mama <laughs> as a do-over for the day to make up for how he treated the guy earlier and so he takes up uh, Sean home and then Sean goes to the door and Shamika comes outside. She didn't tell uh, um, Deputy Brooks, thank you, have a nice day, kiss my behind or nothing. She just closed the door and went on back in the house. And I thought, why you do him like that? Because he is like kind of sort of one of the good cops. But then I guess if you go along with the bad cops, that kind of negates the whole good cop thing. So but anyway, Shamika could have said thank you to the man. We move over to Governor Emons and she has so much going on and she is under so much stress. And so with the whole uh, Pastor Janae being arrested, Sarah is telling her, you know, she needs to cancel her appointments for the day. But she says, no, she wants to continue on as usual and just try to avoid the press. So one of the things that was on her agenda was this honoring these guys who were like, well, not freedom fighters, but they were two guys that sat in in the, remember when they used to do the boycotts of the um, cafeteria um, counters, like in the Woolworths and stuff. So it was a black guy and a white guy that was being honored. And they were two of the people that started the sit-ins. And so while she's talking, the white guy gets up and goes to her and tells her, can she wrap it up because they got a problem. So then she looks over and she sees the black guy and his head is hung down. So she thinks he's sleeping. And then she says, oh, I didn't put uh, Mr. whatever his name was to sleep. And so then the white guy is trying to tell her, no, he's not sleeping, but kind of just wrap it up. So then Sarah goes over to like nudge the guy to wake him up. And we realize that he's actually passed away while he was sitting there. So instead of uh, Governor Emmons going over there, like to check on the guy, make sure, you know, see, do something, her security team kind of ushered her away. And then, of course, the photographers and the reporters and the media, then they're, they're taking pictures. And I'm like, Lord, this woman can't catch a break to save her life. So then later on that evening, we have a scene where um, the governor and the white guy are sitting in the car talking. And so, you know, she's asking him, you know, what was it like, you know, back then and how, you know, courageous he must have been. And so, you know, and apologizing for what happened to his friend and everything. And so he tells her that his father always taught him to be a 24 hour person. And she's like, well, what does that mean? And then he's like, basically know who you are in the system and where you fall and that, you know, you need to be someone that can be depended on 24 hours a day. And then he tells her that he hasn't um, been to the diner in years and that he wants to know what it looks like on the inside. So the governor gets her guy to take, you know, the guy inside to look around and I can't remember, maybe they were going to tear the place down. I don't know, see, like I always be missing like the important details. But there was something going on at this place. Maybe they were going to turn it into a monument or they were going to tear it down or something. But anyway, when they get out the car to go, you know, look at the place closer or to go inside, the governor stays in the car and then she just breaks down and starts crying. And I kind of like this. It's got to be hard to be a politician who wants to do right, but the wrong thing just keeps happening. So then we go back to Ash and Preston, and so they go to visit um, Deputy Beck to give him a chance to tell them what really happened, you know, but he sticks to his story, and then Ash, you know, lets him know that she knows something else happened, so then he says that they're bluffing and they don't have any information and that, you know, the interview is over, but then Ash lets him know that they do have information 
but Jesse actually filmed what was going on and that they know that he pulled the door open and that it wasn't um, Jesse getting out the car on his own. So then he's looking like, oh, hell, <laughs> you know, so that scene, you know, kind of goes away. And then we have a scene of Joshua where he goes to Carrie. She's staying with her relatives. And so he goes over there to let her know that he misses her. And then Carrie lets him know that she misses him also. And and that the kids missed him and so then there was a scene earlier where Carrie was talking to her mom and she was basically telling her that you know basically what I said last week that the man already down on his luck the last thing he needs is for his woman to beat him down even even further so I guess she took that advice and so they decided that it was time for her to come home with the kids so they kind of reconciled and I thought that was a good look. So then we go back to Ash and she's in her hotel room and it looks like she's FaceTiming because she's talking to Kai and telling her how much she loves her and how important she is and that she didn't know what she would do if she didn't have Kai because she was her inspiration. But it turns out that it wasn't FaceTime or Skype, that she was actually making a video and then she was um, moving it into a folder. So I'm thinking like maybe she does a personal video diary that if something ever happens to her then somebody can get these videos to Kai to let Kai know that she was loved. So I thought it was a heartfelt expression of love and to be able to do something to you know leave a legacy to your kids and maybe your grandkids and generations down the line. So later that evening her and Preston go to that bar you know where all the deputies hang out drinking and shooting pool and everything so Preston is like wow we here. So then uh, Lieutenant Breland goes out back to smoke a cigarette or something and Ash follows him out there. So then the two get into a confrontation and it turns into like a UFC brawl. <laughs> I mean, they were fighting each other like, like it was two men fighting. And then somehow Ash got the upper hand and she handcuffed um, Breland to a fence. And then she whooped his ass. That's all I can say. And if it had not been for Preston coming out there and stopping her, she probably would have killed Breland. But she was so angry because, you know, he was throwing up in her face about he wrote that report up and he was sending it in, you know, saying that she was drunk driving and she, you know, accosted the police officer and everything. And Ash just lost it, seriously lost it. So after that, you know, scene was over with, they go back, you know, to the hotel. And then the unthinkable happens. <laughs> Just don't even want to repeat it. I don't want to repeat it. I don't want to repeat it. But <sighs> Ash made love to Preston. Or should I say Preston made love to Ash and helped her, you know, chase all her blues away. You know, he told her that he didn't think that Breland was actually going to file the report that he was probably just scaring her, but they got busy, y'all. They they did the do, and I'm telling you, I just wasn't ready for it because all I could think was, dang, Preston, she slept with your brother in the back of the car like two weeks ago. How you gonna hit that? And your brother told you um, that she was crazy. But anyway... I just didn't need for that to happen, but it did. So then you guys know how the show closes out with these little cameo shots. And so in this week's episode, we have Governor Evans and she's sleep on the couch. And then somebody comes and like pulls the cover up on her shoulder. And I couldn't tell if she was in her office and it was Sarah that came or if she was at home and it was her daughter that came into the room, you know, and pulled the covers up. But that poor woman is exhausted. And then we move over to Deputy Beck and Carrie, and they're in bed together. And I think she asked him, was he going to be indicted? And he said yes. And then he just like rolled over and went to sleep. And then we have Preston. He's gotten up and gotten dressed. And Ash is like knocked out. So I guess whatever he did was soothing to her soul and put her to sleep. And so he goes into the storyboard room and he's looking at the video. And from the expression on his face, he may have seen something that they didn't see before. Like... Maybe Jesse had already opened the door when um, when Joshua walked up or something like that. But anyway, 
it was another good episode and like i said two more to go and i just won't see how they wrap all this up so guys let me know what you think leave your comments below rate the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and until the next time take care bye bye Thank you.